welcome to the last day of the summit. This session, I want to talk around PowerShell in a heterogeneous environment. If you've not met me before, my name's Richard Sidaway, uh, PowerShell.org director. I've been an MVP for eight years, written some books, done some blogging, do a bit of speaking. Uh, been around the IT industry for more years than I care to remember. Currently doing a whole bunch of stuff around orchestration and automation for the cloud services of the company I work for. Today, um, I want to look at some of the potentially peripheral things that are going to become a bit more important over time. We think of PowerShell and ourselves as Windows admins, that's going to sort of change over time, I think, as we get into a more heterogeneous environment. In reality, we're already in a heterogeneous environment because we've got a whole bunch of stuff beyond Windows machines. So I want to look at heterogenea, ugh, that top thing, um, non-domain remoting in passing because that is awkward. Oh my. You all know what OMI is? All right, good. Show your DSC running on Linux, which is cool, and look at the network switch commandlets, which are new in WMF5. So, anybody want to define heterogeneity? I will learn to pronounce that one of these days. That's, that literally is what it is. The probably closest you'll get to a homogeneous environment is a bunch of Windows devices in a single domain with minimal networking. <laughs> there are a lot of examples in the environment. So we've got Linux, Unix machines, um, we've got network switches, and we've got a whole bunch of non-Microsoft products that PowerShell enabled. So the, the sort of simple side of this, things like NetApp, VMware, Citrix, Dell, they all have PowerShell commandlets, or they've got SIM OMI classes that exist and enable you to manage it. The more complex situation is where you're having to go to things like Linux boxes, network switches, and in re reality, we are going to end up managing more and more non-Windows bits in the environment as we're expected to do an awful lot more with less resources, less people. And as PowerShell takes over the world, it will become much easier to, to do this. So I'm going to start by looking at OMI, the Open Management Infrastructure. It's basically SIM for non-Windows, or WMI for non-Windows, probably a better way of putting it. If you look over the history, WMI is actually SIM. So the standard is defined by the DMTF. Microsoft took that, tweaked it around a bit for Windows boxes, made WMI. Now going back to the standards, the Linux implementation um, is done as open source through the open group. It still needs some work. It's not <coughs> just a simple whack it on and use it, but I'll show you some of that as we go through. There's a very good blog series about this from uh, one of the PowerShell MVPs. Um, these are worth worthwhile reading if you want to learn some more about this. If you want to set this up on a Linux box, it needs a little bit of work. So you've got to put um, the compilers on. You need OpenSSL, preferably patched. Um, you need the authentication modules, and just as an, an aside, if you've never seen it done, you can use uh, a PAM module to enable authentication and authorization from AD, so you can actually effectively get your Linux boxes as members of your domain. That, actually, I might do a talk on that another time, because that, that's quite fun. I built the box using CentOS. Um, there's a couple of issues with the Linux machine. You need to make it a gener generation one, and you need to use the legacy network adapter. 
installing it. It's, as usual with Linux, it's a download and uh, install. I'll leave this, the slides will be available so you can see this in detail. I'm not going to read through this little lot. And then you get some sample code, um, nice class called frogs, so you can learn all about frogs on Linux. Uh, and if you're going to create some classes, you need to define a schema and then generate the provider and the make file. And it generates th those files at the bottom and then compile all the, all the code. And then you register the provider and then you're good to go. So there's still a couple of issues with it, as I'll show you when I get to the demo. Um, get sim class works if you're going after a single class. It doesn't go, it doesn't work if you go for wildcards. So you can't go do just do get sim class class name and star. Uh, the standard sim classes, the things that you would expect to find like um, sim underscore uh, logical so a computer system or the uh, operating system or the, the disk classes or anything like that aren't currently available. It needs some more examples and it needs some more people to play with it to give a bigger push to get some of these things done. So let's have a look at this thing in action. As somebody said in Amsterdam, this is a PowerShell summit, not a PowerPoint summit. Okay, so first bit is just a comment to me to test the setup before I start demonstrating. So create a credential, or standard stuff. Set the options for the sim session. You, you've all seen new sim session option before? Yeah, anybody not? One of the primary uses for, for that is if you need to drop down to DCOM there rather than running the sim session over WSMAN. Correct session. And just, just ping the thing, make sure it's there. Yay. Okay, let's have a look at Test WSMAN against the WSMAN implementation on the Linux box. The nice thing about doing this with uh, OMI is you get the WSMAN stack and you get the SIM provider all in one go. It makes it much, much easier setting it up rather than going scrabbling around finding all the bits for yourself. Now you'll notice that that failed. Um, it's basically because you need to give it the credentials because it's not in the domain, so it's not picking up the credentials. And you get a bunch of stuff like this. Look familiar using test WS man? It's not quite the same, but it's pretty close. Just drop down and... How long would you say it took you to um, get, get all my up and running on a Linux box? <coughs> The first time I did it, weeks. <laughs> the second time I did it, um, um, from creating the VM to having it up and running and it been responsive, uh, the VM built the install time plus less than an hour. It, it's the if you. There's a white paper about all this. If you follow through the instructions in the white paper, it just works. It's, it's pretty easy. Did it matter what version of CentOS you used? Um, I don't think so. I used CentOS because that was the one that it um, had in the white paper. So that rather than trying to change all the Linux commands for a different flavor of Linux, I just went with CentOS because I'm not a Linux expert, I can fumble my way around a Linux machine, um, and I deliberately put it like that. Um, I managed to get it working, so I think anybody in this room would be able to get it working. 
If you've played with Linux at all, you've got a head start on me. And if we compare this with testablist man against the local machine, you can see it's similar sorts of information. This OMI underscore identify um, is one of the classes that is created when you install it. And it comes back with a whole bunch of information about the machine. That's a very good test that you've got everything set up. If you can get that back, you've won. And it's time to meet the frogs. It's one of those silly example classes that it's very simple, um, but it, it's actually a very useful test because it's a, it's a simple bit of data and it, it's fairly obvious if it's all got it wrong. I mean. What's important is not so much the data that's coming back at this point, is the, um, the way it looks. If you've done get member on <coughs> something returned by get some instance before, that's all going to look very familiar. And this is the nice thing about it, it's exactly the same tools as you use against Windows, it's just that the far end is Linux. How is the uh, namespace defined? Uh, roots in V2, just the same as Windows. What was the question? How is the namespace defined? It's it's just roots in V2, the same as Windows. So the, yeah, and again, if you write your own providers, if you're cleverer than I am and can manage to do that, you can make your own namespace as an admin, just the same as on a Windows box. Sim is, is an industry standard, and it, it works in that manner. It works in the same way as you'd expect it to do on a um, standard Windows box. So the all of the f all of the filtering type stuff that you can do with um, standard sim all works the same. Um, if you're worried about case because it's a Linux box, it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter whether you're looking for Fred with a capital F or a lit left. All of your PowerShell standard techniques work, because by the time you've got the data back to this box, PowerShell doesn't really care where it came from. It's an object, and it's just going to work with it exactly the same. Please don't use that sort of construct when you're doing sim properly. It's much more efficient to use filter and filter off at the source end. You can select as you would expect. <coughs> right, time for something a little bit more useful. There's, um, where did I find it? Uh, Bartek's written a process provider. Uh, so it's the equivalent of, or partially equivalent of Win32 process class. look like standard process stuff. All right, not everything's there because it's just a, a demo uh, class, but it's the same sort of thing. How did you discover the class? The... What was the question? How did you discover the class name? Um, I happened to work it out from reading the, the code. The... That's one of the issues. The, the current implementation doesn't accept wildcards when you use get sim class. Um, I'll show you that in a minute when I do another demo. It just goes there. Just do not want to play. That I think is something that's in the pipeline to be fixed. At that point, you can do it exactly the same as you can with a Windows box, and you just use get sim class and search through it as um, as you would normally. At that point, 
we're laughing. Uh, you'll have noticed that I'm using all of the same command lids. Don't try and use get WMI object in this way because the Linux box doesn't want to know about DCOM and it'll just go, nah, it does not compute. Um, so what was I doing there? Ah, was it? Just, just, just pull the data down a little bit, make it more understandable. Man, that's got all the processes. Right. So you got the name, you got the process ID, and you got the parent ID. And of course, you can pull individual processes back. The this OMI server. This is the, the sim server running on the, the Linux box. You can run standard queries. It's what was the question? How, how do you track the different run states of the processes on the Linux box? You have to write that into the provider. Um, this, this isn't out of the box. This is something that somebody's actually written to do this. Um, one of, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, later, one of the things that this actually needs to make it really, really useful for us is the sort of standard process service. The, the classes that you would expect to find on a Windows box, get them ported and get them working. Um, it might need a community effort, it might need uh, somebody to sit down and do it, but that, that's what we really need to make this really useful. Yes, sir? Have you seen any kind of provider library for it? Is there any provider libraries for it? I've not seen any to date. I have been searching diligently, hoping that somebody would do it, because it makes the demo much more interesting. Because um, you can only go so far with frogs. But um, I haven't seen anything yet. I think there was a question over here. Yeah. So you, you piqued my curiosity on the whole notion of OMI and how to interrupt operating with Linux, yeah. right? Where Linux is really, really important for case. Is there something in the OMI standard that, that deals with the case sensitivity, case, it, case sensitivity of, the, of the actual files? It's going to have to be within the OMI Simpson. Oh, sorry, the, the question was regarding the, thank you, Lee. The question was regarding the case sensitive, sensitivity of Linux and how that's dealt with. So you saw from the example I was giving you earlier, I was doing a filter um, and the case didn't actually matter. Um, I'm assuming, and I know assumptions can come up by you, but my assumption is that that's handled in the sim server that OMI sets up. And it, it's, the, it's the only place that I can think of that actually does it. Because at the client end, it's not going to know about what case it should be. So the only place that it can be done is actually on the, the Linux box. Thank you. That is a guess, but a sort of logical guess. Yeah, so if you, com if you compare to um, Win32 process, there's still an awful lot to add into this um, because there's all of these properties that we haven't got. Um, I'm hoping that some kind developer will pick this up and finish it off for us because it's a good example. Right. Any questions on OMI to begin with? Yeah. Yeah, so what I've been to like the OMI's open group site yeah. and it's kind of dead? Mm, no, it, I think it'd be safe to say it hasn't been revised since August last year rather than it's dead. Yeah. And I'll well, I mean, like, from a community standpoint, it's kind of dead. It's not like a GitHub where there's issues. Yeah, there's, uh, there's not a lot of people working on it. Yeah. Um, however, when I move a little bit further through the session, you'll see why it ain't dead and it ain't going to go yeah, away. Yeah, I, I don't not say yeah. dead in the 
not product set, but but like from a community standpoint, you said like we need to get people to kind of build providers yeah. and have some some knowledge base to work off of. You know, where is that happening? Is that happening on a forum somewhere or? I've not seen anything. That's why I was making the statement that it needs to be done. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that you will find is OMI is actually available in your production use. Um, it's, there's at least two sets of network switches have it installed and available for you to play with. Uh, Cisco and Arista have both got it installed. Uh, when I was setting this talk up, I asked my boss if I could demonstrate over the web against our core switches. His face was a picture. Um, <laughs> the polite answer, the version of his answer was no. Uh, so I've, I've actually got an Arista switch as a virtual appliance that I'll show you in a minute. But this is available and this next bit it makes it a little bit more uh, useful. So you can play with this at home. Um, you can get a, an Arista VMDK uh, from their website. Uh, all you have to do is register and it's a freebie download. If you want it on Hyper-V, um, just go convert the, the, the disk, build a VM, uh, uh, configure the switch. I'll, I won't go through that for time at the moment, but um, I'll leave this, the script to do that in the, in the code. Um, and then experiment. So the Microsoft Virtual Machine Converter, if you've not played with that, that's great for uh, converting the, the disk. You'll see a lot of blogs about um, an XE that doesn't exist anymore. It's PowerShell commandlets. Uh, and that's how easy it is to convert it. And then to configure the switch, set an IP address on the management interface. If you've played with switches at all, all of this stuff is bulk standard. So you just set the SIM provider, uh, set a couple of ACLs on it, and allow OMI in, and you're good to go. So we'll have our very secure password. We'll set a few bits for the session. So computer name, uh, because it's effectively an appliance, uh, access it over the IP address, set the, set the usual things in the uh, session option. Normally, you'd stick a certificate on this and do it properly, but for demo purposes, it's a lot easier just to skip all the checks. Do not do this at home. Or better, do, better still, do not do this where your boss can see what you're doing. We'll create a new session to that switch. And this is the bit I was saying about get sim class. If you try to use a wildcard, it goes. Um, I try to be clever and use the WQ. WQL white card, which is percent sign. Yeah, doesn't want to play with that either. So taking a wild guess, uh, SIM has an ether port, Ethernet port class. That's there. That standard SIM class. Um, digging around in the Arista documentation, they've done exactly what Microsoft did with WMI, and they've cloned the class give you their own one. So you can dig into that in the usual manner using get sim class. I love this command look. It's so great for taking sim sim classes apart. So you can see the you can see the properties. If you played with switches, the typical things that you want to use. Have we got any methods? Yep, so you can reset it, enable the device, save the properties, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> I 
DC. Standard sim return, uh, even to the fact that the, the statuses are integer codes that you've got to work out what they are. Um, after a bit digging around, two, for some bizarre reason, actually means that it's up and running and it's, everything's wonderful. Um, but if you're running WMF5, this gets even easier because there's a module that comes as part of that called Network Switch, which has a whole bunch of commandlets that talk over OMI to the switch, make life so much easier. So is two questions at the back can take first? The question is, are the uh, OMI classes discoverable from the command line? Not at the stage of just getting a list of classes that are available. It's an issue, it's a bug. I'm expecting that to be resolved in the, at some time in the future, because it, it, it's daft that it doesn't work that way. Um, if you've got a vague inkling um, from looking at the SIM standards of the sort of classes that should be around, you can start making educated guesses, which is what I was doing for the um, for this. And in terms of getting this set up and running, um, it was surprisingly easy. It, once you got the, 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 the biggest time was the converting the VMDK. Uh, and that's just a matter of process and time. Sorry, there's another question back there? Okay. Sorry, feature requests for OMI? Yeah, you need to feed those into the uh, Open Group website. So these commandlets um, all work over SIM, um, same as you've seen. If you don't like SIM um, or you're not comfortable with it, the way things are going, um, you need to become so. So you can dig into the features a little bit more, and you can see that what you're actually getting back is sim objects. And we'll you can see various data at the switch level. You can dig down into VLANs. I'm only going to give you a flavour of this because this, I want to have a quick look at. DSC as well, and you can, you've seen the Ethernet ports, you can work with um, individual ports, you can work on individual things, so you can see the, the port, let's just cut that data down so it makes it a little bit easier to read. So the management port is the one we're working over, the others would be your actual um, working ports. So you can easily disable things. Your network guys are going to love this. So you can see that the state has changed, so three is actually disabled. Um, this, if you look in the documentation on the DMTF website, you can see all, what, what all the states mean. If you're doing this um, for production level scripts, you write a little routine um, to actually select off the state and convert it to something more readable. We'll re-enable it, just so we remember where we are. And quick. No, it's gone in, it's enabled. Sometimes you'll see that come up as a 10, which means that it's, um, it's just in the process of coming up. And then finally, you can save the switch configuration. Uh, that's actually saved on the switch, it doesn't save it locally. 
So, we've got AMI, it means we can manage Linux boxes, or we will be able to manage Linux boxes when we get the classes we need. We can manage network switches. We're starting to take over everything from PowerShell. Good start, let's keep, keep it going. The last bit that I want to see just stretches that even further. So, DSC on Linux. Sorry. How does this work with my, uh, I don't know, four or five year old sister or something? You'll have to check on the. How, how does this work with my four or five year old Cisco switch? You have to see whether, from Cisco, whether OMI is actually enabled on it. Um, my suspicion is that at that age it may not be. Um, I think it's the last 18 months or so, two years that this has been coming in. Probably depends on if you're on the iOS or NX OS. The yeah. NX is yeah. yeah, could be. Not, not. Yeah, so the, it, as the gentleman said, it depends on the iOS or. So what was the other one? NA? Well, they have Nexus OS, so they have the, the old one. Yeah, so it's more likely to be the Nexus OS. So DSC on Linux is currently a CPP download, um, currently open source. I'm using the word currently, that doesn't mean I'm, that I know it's going to change, I'm just stating exactly how it is at the moment. Um, and the current implementation is push mode only. Do we know if there's a new version of this in the pipeline? I don't know. No, um, yes. I will be talking a very little bit about DSC on Linux in my talk at the end of the day. Thank you. <coughs> there are so, new things in the pipeline. Yeah. Right. So watch this space. You'll hear it first here <laughs> later th or later this afternoon. So you've got a bunch of current resources. They're all labeled NX whatever. So file, script, user group, service. And given the way Linux works, the fact that you can actually Manipulate files gets you an awful long way in reality. Um, the top line is why I started with the OMI, because DSC sits in top of OMI. If for no other reason than you want to use DSC on Linux, it's worth getting your head around OMI and experimenting with it. You need to install the Python um, and implementation and the Python dev tools. Last September in Amsterdam, Jeffrey Snow said that eventually you'll be able to write resources in Python. Uh, whether that is still in the pipeline or not, we'll eventually hear. Uh, download the Linux component from GitHub, unpack it, build it, install it. It's straightforward, it works. Uh, if you, once you've got OMI up, that's the major hurdle. If you uh, if you've tested that and you know that's working, the DSC bits are nice and easy. There's a couple of um, URLs there um, talking through it. A, do, do, do. So it needs WMF5 at the client end or your <coughs> DSC server end. And the resources oddly install in the Windows PowerShell modules not in the standard DSC resource. That one's probably the major gotcha. Um, I know people, and if you don't actually read the bit where it says install it, where to install it, you end up scratching your head as to why it's not working for a long, long time until you actually do, do read it. So remember that bit, if nothing else. And it's time to try this out. So, that. So we'll create some more credentials. <coughs> this is credentials against the uh, Linux box. Set up the session. And that's for, that's for Dom. Of course, he's not here. So, 
So I've been playing around with this. So it knows that there's a configuration for this Linux box. It's currently absent. But it's working in, in exactly the same way as Windows box works. So create a configuration. Let me just flip to this. Uh, <coughs> look familiar? DSC? Give it the node, tell it what you're using. One important thing is that you have to, you have to implicitly, sorry, explicitly import the DSC resource. Um, typical DSC parameters, ensure type, the destination path, contents. So we'll These bits at the bottom with the modify them off, these are because of running this on WMF5 and the current DSC for Linux bits is sort of WMF4 prior to the patch, so you need to rip a few things out of the MOF file to, to allow it to work. I'm presuming that by the time all this is released, um, all of these will be sorted. So there's our MOF file created. Standard looking MOF file, DSC MOF file. Nothing in there that is really um, untoward. Start DSC configuration to apply it. You can test it. And then you can see the configuration. Simple stuff, exactly. And just to prove that it's not actually just smoke and mirrors. <coughs> There's the file. It works. This is the bit that really blew my mind the first time I did it. Just, just the thought of what I was doing. So I'm going to run a config against a Windows box and a Linux box simultaneously. Do the same thing to both. And again, it's just a trivial one, creating a file, but just to show you the that it does all work. So we'll set up the machines we're going to use. Um, we'll set up the, the roles that I want. We'll create so we'll do all that first. Yeah. We'll create the sim sessions. Windows box is in the domain, so I don't need to worry about that. Got our sim session. Create one to the Windows box. The reason I'm creating them um, in two steps is that I'm not using the, I don't need the options on this one. Uh, and then we'll look at the configuration. So again, you have to import the resource, you set up the file configuration. Um, they look remarkably similar, even the ones against the Linux box, ones going against a Windows box. So we'll run that. You <coughs> it's 
excuse me. You've seen t Steve talk about the um, using the roles and the doing uh, configurations in this manner. If you haven't, go and bend his ear because he can explain it an awful lot better than I can. And oh yeah, don't forget the configuration data. I was testing this and it wasn't working. And I was why on earth is not, this not working? Modify them off and. And we good. Hey, just for grids, can you make the camel, can you make the file name camel case? On which one? Whatever file you wrote for that Linux file. So you want you want to see the file name as camel case? I think it'll do it. If this breaks. <laughs> <laughs> we will have words later. <laughs> so the question was, can we make the file name camel case? Uh, not that one. But I suppose you'd like to see it on both of them. So this one, yeah? Yeah. So camel case. Okay. All right? We know it's going to work on the Windows, but we'll just chuck that in for fun. So, try this again. I will cry if this breaks. <laughs> Sorry? Thank you. Yeah, and you can turn your camera off as well. <laughs> Seems to have worked. This isn't necessarily the best way to do it, but it's just simple and it's self explanatory for the demo. Break the windows one, but the Linux book one worked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll have a look at that. And what are we doing? So, yeah, we'll just quickly whip through that. Yeah, all right. So, Bottom line, within the scope of what you can do and in terms of the resources available, DC for Linux works. So, managing Linux based machines in your heterogeneous <coughs> environment, um, we've got OMI, we've got DC for Linux, they start to become treatable and manageable in exactly the same way as you're managing your Windows boxes. What do we need? We need the standard SIM classes, preferably in a manner that's easy to build and get onto the Linux machines. A little bit about the location of the DSC resources. Um, now that's an old bit because the DSC resource kit is now on GitHub, but it needs to be all together so it's easy to find. And we probably need some more DSC resources, so community effort. You the guys, you are the community. Um, I expect to see the stuff up there next week. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you need to contact me, um, to my blog, um, available through PowerShell.org, either, either of those emails. Um, I am I'm on Twitter, I just don't use it. Um, 
I think I'm the only person in the world that has four times the number of followers than the tweets I've ever issued. <laughs> don't know why. And please fill in your evals, not just for this session, but for all the sessions you've seen. They are very, very useful to us in helping us um, decide the sorts of topics that you guys want to see. This is your summit. This is the community summit. We only facilitate it and make it happen. It's the topics that you want to see that are important, uh, not the ones that we decide. The sessions will be uh, recorded and put up on YouTube. If you've been watching that, they've been going up all through the, um, the last couple of days through the hard work that Don's been. He deserves a round of applause for sitting and doing them all. Thank you very much for coming to this session. Thank you very much for coming for the, to the summit. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of it and hope to see you again next year. Thank you.